In Focus discussion tonight on National Small Business Week, a time to recognize the important contributions of our country's entrepreneurs and small business owners. According to America's Small Business Development Center Network, more than half of our population either own or work for a small business. They create about two out of every three new jobs each year. So tonight, we'd like to highlight two local business owners and then discuss the contributions of the Hispanic business community. Up first in our conversation is Johnny Ritchie, co-owner of Rockwell Watches. Johnny, good to have you here. Welcome to the show. Good to see you, Rosie. Thanks for having me on. Johnny, tell us about Rockwell Watches. What's the history and foundation behind your business? You know, Rockwell Watches, we started about 2007. Uh, my business partner, a man by the name of Rich Agate, loved motorcycles and loved action sports, and we wanted to come up with a brand or something cool that would fit into that market. And so watches was kind of it. We, we figured we'd start with a watch company. We didn't see a lot of watches around, and so uh, we, we jumped in with watches, and, and it's kind of been history ever since. So. I love that. Now, are your watches durable, as in like they can sustain uh, pressure or maybe high impact? Because I noticed that in the photos that you sent us, there were a lot of athletes, right? Those who are active. Yeah. So, you know, uh, we like to think our watches are as tough as the people that wear them. And by what I mean by that is when we first started, it was people in the action sport world. It was these athletes that were out there risking life and limb to entertain the masses. And they found, uh, they fell in love with our brand. And so we attended all those events. We were at all the action sports events, uh, Supercross and Dew Tour and X Games and boxing matches and mixed martial arts. We were doing all these really fun stuff. And the athletes just loved our product because of that. The durability, um, our lifetime warranty on all of our products. And, and we just knew that we had to develop something that was not only fashionable but that was functional that these guys could use when they're not just sitting at home or or uh, at the office when they get out and do their weekend warrior stuff they could wear a watch and uh, it was durable and and tough enough to take a beating I definitely think your watches add some swagger to the people who wear them <laughs> so definitely fashionable now as a small business owner what have been the keys to your success and growth for more than 10 years now you know I can just say it, it, we've been very, very fortunate to, to surround ourselves. Our company really is like a family. Um, we all, you know, we attend events together. We work together every single day. We work out in the mornings at our training facility together. And it's like a family atmosphere. We all have each other's backs. Now that doesn't mean we don't fight, we don't argue, and we don't get into it, but uh, we just know that we all have the common goal. We want to make Rockwell as cool as, as uh, we possibly can. We want to sell a lot of watches and a lot of sunglasses and, and really spread you know, the, the mantra of Rockwell, which is live unrivaled. We want you to, when you wear our product, to uh, feel that, man, you, you could conquer the world and look good doing it. So, but yeah, I would just say that core group that you just, you know, you're going to get up every day and you're going to grind, surround yourself with your employees and people that are like-minded and that love and are as passionate about the brand as you are. Now, when it comes to branding, you were an early adopter to using influencers in your marketing, such as athletes, celebrities. So tell us about that strategy and how did it help your business grow? Yeah, well, you know, the rise of social media, right? It's everywhere, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Um, we just found that there were these people that, that, we, that fell in love with our product and they had larger platforms. And so what we did is we created this kind of this ambassador program where we would reach out to these people or more times than not they were reaching out to us and wanted to rep our product. And so it made it really easy, right? We, we, we leveraged the ambassadors, their network, their reach. And from there, our, our business just grew. Um, but you can never really dictate who your customer is going to be. And over the last five or six years for us, it has been first responders. Uh, policemen, firefighters, members of the military have adopted our watches and adopted our that live unrivaled spirit. Uh, these are the sheepdogs that um, give, have given us our freedom and protect our freedoms. And they are now our core base of customer. Um, and so those are the influencers and the charities and the things that we support uh, pretty much revolve around our first responder community. So it's been great. Um, we love those guys because they've got our back and they know that we know that with them around, we're going to be safe and we're going to be able to con continue to be free to do the things that we love, like grow an awesome business and, and have a great time doing it. On that note, with social media, how have platforms like Facebook, Instagram, help you scale your business as both a marketing and sales tool? 
Yeah, well, once again, with our ambassador program, you know, we were able to, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that spend a lot of money for advertising. We've, we spend very, very minimal on actual advertising, but what we do do is our ambassadors have a skin in the game. They make money off of what they sell. So if they're out there pushing and promoting the brand, the more they do so, the more money they stand to make. Instead of just writing someone a $10,000 check and hoping that it works, we've used this model to say, look, go out, push and promote the brand. The more you sell, the more money you make, the better we do, the longer we can do this. And, and that's just been amazing. We've, at one point in time, I believe we had over a thousand ambassadors uh, pushing and promoting our brand. Now that number has gone down, but now it's this really core group, like I said, of these influencers that are in that first responder space, whether it be military members, police officers, firefighters, people that um, really re respect what we're doing as much as we respect what they're doing out in the field, so. Now, Johnny, you made it through the COVID-19 pandemic and you're still going strong. So what advice would you give to other small business owners about growing their business, particularly during economic downturns and pandemics? Well, we lost about 60% of our core customer base with the pandemic and a lot of our business from our corporate custom program. We do a lot of watches for other businesses to help their branding. Um, for, for instance, we make all of Under Armour's watches. Well, a lot of businesses shut that down. They weren't doing incentives or gifts or rewards. So they were kind of holding that back. But once again, our core demographic, our core customer are first responders. So police officers, firefighters, military members, those guys were all still working. They were all still out in the field doing what they do. And so um, it didn't dip badly enough for it to affect the core group, right? We still, we didn't ha never had to lay anybody off. We continued to punch through the pandemic. Um, you know, we were cautious, but we came to work every day. And um, I can say that that was a big part of it. We just knew that we had, we couldn't stop. We had to continue to grind, push through it. And we knew that we would see light at the end of the tunnel, which we've seen. Now everything is getting back to normal. Uh, but we're selling, we're, we're pushing a lot more of our corporate watches. We're doing a lot more business to business development now that things are kind of eased up a little bit. Um, but we just stuck to it. We just didn't really, we never gave up. We just said, look, we have to punch through this. And it, we did it. And so um, once again, it, it's a, it's a tip of the hat to our employees, to our core group that come to work every single day and they bust their butt to, to put out an amazing product that um, we're super passionate about and, and happy that people are passionate about it as well. You've been hearing from Johnny Ritchie, co-owner of Rockwell Watches. And Johnny, thank you so much for being a part of the conversation tonight. Thank you. We'll be right back. Thanks for staying with us for our second In Focus discussion tonight on National Small Business Month. Up next in our conversation is Ron Clough, multi-franchise owner of the Joint Chiropractic. And Ron, thank you so much for being here tonight. Oh, thanks for having me. Really appreciate the help that you guys are doing for the small business community. Anytime. Ron, you spent more than 13 years working for Corporate America, and then you decided to start your own small business. So what prompted this decision? Well, you know, I, like you said, I, I worked for Microsoft for about 15 years, and I was given 80, 90 hours a week to this company working very, very hard and being very successful with it. But... I really wanted to put that time and effort into, into me and, and into our family. And so just working really hard for myself and, and finding something I really loved and had a passion for. Now, what differences do you see between corporate America and then small business America? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. For me, it's, it's kind of driving your own passion when you, when you do that. You can be passionate about working for someone else or be passionate about what you do for yourself. But for me, it's really about focusing on, on doing the things that you have more control over. Um, in corporate America, you just didn't really have that control. You know, you had to go through layers and layers upon of, of just different um, people and, and, and leadership. Um, but with this, it just, you know, the buck stops with me. And so it's really helpful. Now, in your experience, what is the toughest part about being a small business owner and what part is the most rewarding? Uh, probably employees. Employees is, is the toughest part. It's just finding the great people that have the same passion that you do and hiring those great people, paying them well, and then working with them to show them the same uh, growth pattern that you want to go with. You know, if they have the same goal that you have and, and they're going to work towards that with you, it's a great partnership that you can really grow towards that. It really helps to, to move the business. Now, the Joint Chiropractic is a national franchise. How does this help you manage and grow the business? 
It's a, it's a huge help for me as, a, as an owner because the platform's already been set up, the different layers that, that you need to do, whether it's marketing or sales, computer systems, all that different things already set up for us. And so it's really just working the plan that they've already given to me, um, going forward with that, hiring great people that are passionate about it, and then moving forward with it. So like all of my, my sales, all of my uh, marketing is all taken care of in that direction. Now, Ron, I'm wondering, how did the COVID-19 pandemic affect you? You're working with patients, those who have to be in very close proximity to your employees. What was the impact there? Well, we were very lucky. We were considered essential health care here in Utah. And so it helped us quite a bit to really focus for our people. We, we saw about a 20% drop in like March, April time frame where you know, they're really locking things down. People were afraid to go out and staying at home. But as, as more and more people, you know, they, their pain started coming back and they just needed that help, that help that we could give to them through chiropractic. And so they started coming back. And within a couple of months, that 20% drop actually started growing. So we've had very good luck with our three clinics here. And the 20 clinics here in, in all of Utah have just really seen some great growth this year. How have social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, and other digital fronts help you grow, scale, and connect with your clients? We, we couldn't be as successful as we are without the help of social media. We spend so much money um, just working and, and making sure that those have great content. And our, our number one goal is to educate with that platform. And so being able to post at least weekly to share some type of antidote with people, whether it's you know, people on their phone that are leaning over, looking at their phone all day long, have text neck, you know, or straining and doing those type of things. Whether you're sitting at a desk, you're leaning over a computer all day long. So being able to educate with Facebook, Instagram, showing people that they're not alone in these things and don't go take a lot of medicine, don't go and, and try to, you know, go to the doctor and, and get muscle relaxers, those type of things. We can help with those small little things. So just educating the public and getting them out to chiropractic really helps. Now, what's your best advice to anyone looking to start a business or um, those who want to pursue that small business ownership route today? You know, for me, it's about three different things. One is to make sure that you have a passion for what you want to do because it's so much easier to go out and work and, and, to, and to convey that passion to other people. And then secondly, find something that you really, that you, that is already established. For me, going with the franchising route was just great because they really back you up. It's, they've already had success. You can talk to other owners before you get involved with that and really work forward, you know, forward towards them. And then lastly, just find, finding good financing um, and being able to help with that. You've been hearing from Ron Clough, multi-franchise owner of the Joint Chiropractic. Ron, thank you so much for your insight. We appreciate your time. Thanks so much. We'll be right back. Welcome to our third and final In Focus discussion tonight on National Small Business Month. Rounding out our conversation tonight is Javier Palomares, President and CEO of the United States Hispanic Business Council. And Javier, thank you so much for being here How tonight. How are you, Rosie? Thanks for having me. Now, I understand the U.S. Hispanic Business Council is new, like a day new. <laughs> so tell us about its establishment and why there is a need for what the council does. Well, you know, the United States Hispanic Business Council advocates for the 4.4 uh, million Hispanic-owned businesses in this country that collectively contribute over $750 billion to the American economy. Uh, our role is to call attention to the contributions of our burgeoning Hispanic business community and remind America that we're reporting for work. Uh, this is a good news story. It's about the growth of the American economy and how we play a role, a pivotal role, in that growth. National Business Week also coincides with Hispanic Heritage Month. Yeah. Let's talk about the impact and magnitude of the Hispanic business community to our U.S. economy. Well, as I just said, uh, you know, there's some 4.4 million Hispanic owned businesses uh, in the nation. We are the fastest growing segment of the American economy. Um, and, you know, I want to commend the station, by the way, for taking time to recognize the importance of American small business, all American small businesses. Uh, and as you pointed out earlier in, 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 a, in a prior segment, 
two-thirds of all new jobs in this country are created by our small businesses. So a tip of the hat to you and the team here for recognizing that American small businesses are the engine of the American economy. They are what drives our economy. And within that context, Hispanic-owned small businesses are the fastest growing segment. We are starting new ventures at a rate of three to one when compared to the general market. So this is a great time to be an entrepreneur in America. It's obviously very challenging. Obviously, we're all going through the, uh, you know, the, the, the buffeting of this pandemic. But the reality of it is, our small businesses, they're sticking to it, they're, they're making it through, they're working together, and they're showing that they are the backbone of the American economy. Now, Javier, in this time of racial reckoning, what are your thoughts about how Hispanic workers are being recognized or maybe not recognized for their contribution to the American economy? Well, you know, it, it, is, it is a time of racial reckoning. It's, 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 it's something that's been long overdue. And, and, and I think as a nation, uh, we're grappling with what, what to do and, and how to move forward as a United States of America. Uh, as it relates to Hispanic workers specifically, you know, our community is going to account for 80% of the new job entrants in our economy. Right now, the most employed male, adult male in America, is actually Hispanic. Employment amongst male Hispanics that are of adult age from the age of 18 to 60 employment rate amongst Hispanic males is 81 percent. The employment rate among, amongst white males is 71 percent and the employment rate amongst male African Americans, adult male African Americans, is 68 percent. So clearly Hispanics are contributing to the greatness of this nation. We're here to work and um, and, and I think it's time that America started to recognize that we contribute to this nation that we love so much. Now let's talk about the COVID-19 pandemic. A lot of Hispanic workers are also our essential workers. Let's discuss that a little bit. Talk about their contribution to our economy and yeah. how that became even more apparent during the pandemic. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Some 19 million Hispanics are considered frontline workers. Uh, they are the ones teaching our kids. They are the ones uh, answering that emergency call. They are the ones uh, answering that fire alarm. They're the ones healing our sick when they arrive at the hospital. We're front and center in lockstep with the rest of America trying to make it through this pandemic. And it, it is our community that is at the forefront of this. We have been most impacted by the pandemic, more so than any other community, but we are rebounding. And we are, like I said, in lockstep with the rest of America, and we're going to get through this. And I believe that the Hispanic frontline workers are going to be a crucial part of our getting through this pandemic together as one nation. Javier, do you think there are any unique challenges that the Hispanic business community faces, whether it's because of socioeconomic factors or even just the neighborhoods that they live in? Anything that comes to mind? Well, surely um, the major challenge that our that our community has is you know we don't we, we don't struggle in starting the businesses as I said earlier we're starting businesses at a rate of three to one when compared to the general market but what comes after once you've launched the business the financing the traditional training the networking that's necessary to really get that small business up and running and create the stability that you need to be able to grow the business and that's where associations like ours and so many others in this country that are working collaboratively to try to help our community to find the resources to work with the financial institutions to get them to invest in our in our small companies because together um, if our community moves forward the entire American economy moves forward how does the Hispanic community connect within their market and outside in ways like social media well it's funny you mentioned social media we over index in the use of social media and and in particular um, you know, platforms like Amazon have been amazingly, amazingly useful for our community. For all American small businesses, frankly, Amazon has been a boon for the growth of those small businesses. And when you look and you dissect the Hispanic business community specifically, we have been the benefactors of a, an amazing platform like Amazon. It's ubiquitous. Uh, it, it can be counted upon. It, it, is, it is easy to use. And frankly, you know, they've been very helpful in terms of getting our businesses not only up and running, but maintaining them and actually growing them. A platform like Amazon has been a godsend to the Hispanic business community. 
Javier, we have to wrap it real quick. What can we do as a community to better support local Hispanic businesses? Well, let me tell you, Utah's already done so much for the Hispanic community at large, and Utah is going to play a very important role in the United States Hispanic Business Council. In fact, our chairman, the top dog, the, the guy that makes the decisions and makes the calls for our association is from Utah. Don Salazar started a company here called CTI Construction, and he volunteers his time and talent as chairman of the board of the United States Hispanic Chamber. Additionally, our general counsel, Mr. Troy Rollins, is literally the serving attorney, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, district attorney for uh, Davis County, Utah. So arguably, the two top and most important posts in our association are held by men that call Utah home. So the Beehive State, uh, state is going to have a, a very important role in the development and the growth of the United States Hispanic Business Council. Javier, thank you so much for being a part of this conversation tonight. We appreciate your time. Thanks, Rosie. Appreciate it.